So welcome to another uh, edition of Ozark's Voices uh, Oral History Project of the Missouri State University Libraries. My name is Tom Peters. I'm the Dean of Libraries. And our special guest today is Wayne Glenn. Welcome, Wayne. Hello there. Today's date is uh, Thursday, September 8th of 2016, and we're actually in uh, uh, Mr. Glenn's uh, home in Nixa, Missouri. Not very casual, am I not? That's right. <laughs> so I wanted to focus today on the Weaver Brothers and Elviry, um, an important piece of uh, the history of the region and of entertainment, I would say. Mm. Uh, let's start with the Weaver family, which was a prominent family in Christian County in the 19th century. The two Weaver brothers were descended from uh, a guy named John Jockey Weaver. He and his wife, second wife I think, came to the Ozarks when it was very wilderness-like, very primitive, pioneer for certain, settled north of what is now Ozark, and we're talking about Jockey. He came in about 1840, something like that. He had a brother that lived in what was then Greene County. Of course, that was Greene County at the time, but Jockey was just that. They had a, a racetrack uh, north of Ozark on his property. It was a plantation. It was called a plantation. He had slaves, and he fathered a number of uh, half-black, half-white kids, mm -hmm. uh, and many of those descendants of Jockey Weaver are still around. Jockey then had a son named John R. Weaver, who became a very prominent uh, Christian County person. He was a carpenter. He was a builder of bridges. He was involved in building back a courthouse in Christian County in 1866. Uh, John R. Weaver was involved in building the uh, wooden bridge, the covered bridge at Ozark like in 1869, 1870. Then he and his dear wife, she was a Gray, Mary Gray, mm -hmm. then they had a son named John Weaver who was the father of the Weaver brothers that we're discussing. Okay. Uh, there's a Weaver Cemetery north of Ozark. That's really named for the Jockey Weaver family. Okay. Uh, so a lot of the Weavers are buried there. Assume. Many, many Weavers are buried just north of Ozark. And basically the Weaver Cemetery is on property that would have been, I'll call it, homesteaded by Jockey Weaver hmm. well before the Civil War. Okay. So the two brothers we're talking about are Leon Weaver. Oh, I've got a birth date of April 18th, 1886. I don't have those things in my brain. All right. And then uh, Frank Weaver, who was born about five years later on February 2nd of 1891. Sounds right. The Weaver brothers, uh, their stage names. Abner and Leon, or in this case, Leon and Abner. Uh, I'm sorry. Abner's Leon was Abner here. and Frank was Cicero. Cicero. That's okay. the name changes. Um, and Cicero, did Cicero ever speak on stage, or was that just to the <clears> No, who's to say? Uh, it's conceivable that when the two of them were working together initially, right after World War I, of course they were brothers, so they had been with each other since the 1880s, or 1890 or so, yeah. uh, and it's conceivable that they had worked together in a primitive show or team before, this, before the World War I era, but then Frank was called into service and so it was after the war, basically 1919 or so, that they really became an act. And I believe from that point on, Frank was always the Harpo Marx type. He didn't say anything. Right, okay. So they got into vaudeville, correct? That's how they kind of got their... They were, uh, Leon especially, was uh, in medicine shows, which was not really vaudeville no. really? to start with. And he played uh, his claim to fame as a, a solo act in the pre-World War I era was as a uh, saw man. In other words, he played the musical saw, mm -hmm. which was a very unusual thing at that time. Uh, there weren't very few others that would do that, but he had a musical knack. Both of them did. They could, either of them could play just about any musical instrument. They had that natural gift. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Leon started out playing in medicine shows. I'm talking about the old wagon shows where they went around snow, basically, claim to sell what they call snake oil, yeah. trying to sell medicinal things to uh, cure, people. Cure your ailments. Right. He ailments. did this uh, probably for five or six years at least before World War I, and then when uh, Cicero, Frank, got out of service, then they began their act together as the Weaver Brothers. Mm -hmm. And I frankly, even though I've done a lot of research on the Weaver Brothers, since they're from Christian County, my home county, I've never determined exactly when Elviry came into the act, okay. but certainly it was in the early 20s. So uh, Elviry, that was her stage name, but her, I believe her real name was June Petrie? Petrie? Petrie. Okay. 
born uh, June 23rd of 1891. So she was the youngest of the what became a trio, a trio act. Uh, I, I have her being born in Chicago. That's what I've been told. That's another thing that is very difficult to pin down. Now, I'm sure that if we uh, went to her descendants, and I say her descendants, mm -hmm. uh, she had two daughters mm -hmm. by another marriage before she married into the Weaver family. She really? uh, was married and had a couple of daughters, uh, one of which, Loretta, uh, made some movies with the Weaver brothers in Elvira in the 1930s. So Loretta, in particular, was uh, a good-looking girl, and she actually made, I think, a few movies uh, at Republic Pictures, minor, minor roles that mm -hmm. uh, the Weaver brothers and Elvira weren't even in. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, Loretta went ahead and, and developed a family, got married, and had children, lived on the West Coast, which is where uh, Elvira and Frank ultimately spent their time, mm -hmm. uh, their latter years. And I would imagine we could get all this cleared up. But June is a little bit of a mystery. I have heard that she was actually, as you say, married, very, I guess born in Chicago, but maybe uh, lived in Springfield when she was young. Hmm. But I don't know that that's the case. You don't know I how don't they think met. so. You don't know how they met or? Well, she was an actress before she knew the Weavers. Hmm. She was also in, as you say, quote unquote vaudeville. So the Weavers went from medicine shows with Leon mm -hmm. to after World War I, gradually getting into vaudeville. Uh, a lot of this is not known research. A lot of this is not mm -hmm. clarified or determined mm -hmm. because as I think most people know that follow entertainment, especially in the good old days, and it's probably that way now too, you couldn't believe the publicity. The publicity was always exaggerated mm -hmm. or in some cases frankly, more than exaggeration, yeah. big fat lives. Made up, yeah. And so about all that we have to go on are the old newspaper articles, mm -hmm. the magazine articles, the billboards of the teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, and they're not consistent. The mm -hmm. things that are said about the Weavers in their earliest years, especially June, is not consistently verified. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm thinking some of her descendants probably could clarify some of that. All right. So she had two daughters from her first marriage. That's correct. And no children. So, for those of you listeners and viewers who don't know anything about this, she ended up marrying both Weaver brothers sequentially. That's correct. Yeah. So she had no children by either Frank or Leon. That is true. All right. Um, so at some point they got together and they formed a trio. That's correct. It would have been in the early 20s. Yep. And they were well known in the vaudeville circuit. Uh, I mean, like, you know, East Coast and Europe even. I, uh, of course, have done a lot of reading on the Weaver Brothers over the last many years. And some people, a lot, actually, a lot of people that are neutral, that don't have any necessarily love for the Weaver Brothers, Nell Vary specifically, say that they were the symbol, their act, created the impression of what Ozark's hillbillies were all about. Yeah. Uh, I guess you call it a stereotype. Yeah. They were the stereotype. Their act was the stereotype for what Ozark's people were supposed to be like, at least on the stage. And we don't really know why. I don't know. If, somewhere I read that Leon was the one who first kind of came up with the hillbilly motif uh, in his act. We don't know what he was, you know, what his intent was there, or you know, just whatever sells, whatever would get him a gig, or... Um... I, uh, I think that they went where the laughs went. Mm -hmm. So when they were starting out, when Leon and Frank, at, initial, at first, and then Elvira, but particularly the two boys, say 19, 19, 19, 20, 19, 21, 1922, mm -hmm. in that first three or four years that they worked together professionally, really, that uh, they were, like any good entertainer, especially comedian types, they were looking for where the response would come from. And I think that the more they used their hillbilly draw, the more that they developed the character of Leon as a smart hillbilly, and Frank Cicero, his brother, who was his real-life brother, mm -hmm. being kind of the <laughs> stupid guy, at least that was the appearance, mm -hmm. They found where the laughs would go, and the more hillbilly they acted on stage, 
the more successful they were. So they played on that. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and I, I, I don't know the history of this, but when you think a lot of brother acts, I mean, there's just, that's kind of an arc, also kind of an archetypal brother act. So you think of the Smother Brothers. Right. Smothers Brothers. One smart, one, one dumb. One, it's a one dumb, you know. And so, and it also probably bleeds into the old idea the buddy movie, you know, where two guys are traveling, one's smarter. That's right. The other one's dumber. Uh, so it's really kind of a, I don't know what you call it, a, a motif mm -hmm. or a, a, a common theme in a lot of entertainment. I believe there were smart men. Uh, I should have said, possibly when we're talking about the Weaver family, uh, possibly when I stated that Jockey was successful, that his son John R. was successful in the milling business, in the construction business of that era, uh, then John, the father of Leon and Frank, he was a teacher, a school teacher, didn't stay with it a long, long time. He primarily farmed when the boys were young, but he had a, an educated background. Uh, they were smart people. Uh, Leon and Frank were not hillbillies. They played the role. Mm -hmm. So they were, you know, smart young men from a prominent family, but... Who I'm sure embarrassed their family to death <laughs> until they became successful and started making million, actually literally millions of dollars. Yeah. I'm sure the family you know, got over that problem. That's right. The embarrassment. Yeah. So after the First World War, the Great War, they that's when they really kind of got into their stride. Somehow June got into the act. So you had the smart country bumpkin. You had the not-so-smart country bumpkin. And then June, as Elviry, what kind of what kind of role did she have in that? In that she vulnerable? was a spinster. Uh, she was mean, hateful, tough. On stage, we're talking about right. playing the right. role. We're right. not talking her about was her a, real person. Yeah. Uh, she was supposed to be impatient with the boys. Uh, Leon, so kind of, you know, what, 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 at a certain age we would have called man, boy crazy kind of. She was, you know, that's right, aggressive towards. That's right, men. And at, at some point, when they had more and more people working in their troop, then she was the one that would bring out the girls and lead them in dancing and and displaying themselves, their petticoats and their beautiful calico dresses and so forth. Mm -hmm. And she was always dressed very, very fancy, Elvari was. Mm -hmm. Whereas the boys, again I'm saying Frank and Leon, where they were dressed, Leon as in overalls or in hillbilly image garb, and Frank was dressed as somebody trying to act like he was going to fit in in the city. He had fancy clothes that were too tight, mm -hmm. like he was wearing somebody else's suit. Mm -hmm. He'd had to find a suit to wear to the city, mm -hmm. and it what didn't fit him. Mm -hmm. And that was Frank. Well, Elvira was prim and proper, mm -hmm. and uh, she was uh, also very, very poor as a singer, so she sang a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and everybody just put up with her because she was so mean, they didn't want to tell her that she couldn't sing. <laughs> so that was part of the whole act. Yeah, and this went on for years. Yeah, so that was kind of, so in the 20s, the 20s was sort of their vaudeville phase, if you will. Um, so what brought them back to Springfield and uh, the Ozarks? They never left. They were always uh, headquartered. They wintered in the Ozarks. Of course, initially, they weren't wintering anywhere. They are just trying to go from job to job. Uh, by the time we get to 1926, 1927, they had developed this act they now no longer were the Weaver Brothers and Elvari as a trio. Rather, they were the Weaver Brothers and Elvari and the Arkansas Travelers, mm -hmm. which they did just that. They traveled, and they had a troop that was made up, forget the three people for a second, they had as many as 15 to 20 people mm -hmm. in their act, in their cast. And so they were traveling all over the United States, Canada, uh, to Europe, at least to England, once, and, once or twice, and this is all taking place in the 1925-1930 era, right before the Great Depression. So by the time we get to the talky era of Al Josen's Mammy and all that kind of stuff, you ain't heard nothing yet, 1927, we find that uh, the Weaver brothers had reached an initial peak. Mm -hmm. they, by that time, they were known to all people in the entertainment field, and they were highly in demand appearing at the best vaudeville places, the best vaudeville theaters, not only, as we said, in the United States, but also in Canada. I thought I read somewhere that they actually performed for the 
royalty, British royalty, out of Windsor Castle. I, that's that's correct. They, yeah. they played the Palladium, yeah. London Palladium, and uh, the king and queen saw their performance. Yeah. Um, so they were a big act. They were successful. They, you know, and and by the time they had the Arkansas Travelers, the whole troupe, they were a complete show. I'm, I'm assuming they had, you know, music, oh, yeah. da dance, song, comedy routines. Right. Uh, a number of, one of the reasons I said that they never left the Ozarks, uh, when they did reach a point by the late 20s, as I said, 1927, 28, they reached a point where uh, they would uh, lay off part of the season. Mm -hmm. In other words, there was a season for vaudeville. They would come back to Springfield uh, at some point, I don't know the exact year, but they bought uh, the old Her Mansion down on the James River between Springfield and Nixa on what is now Highway 160. Yeah. And uh, they lived there. Uh, honestly, Elvira was first married to Leon, then she married Frank. Uh, they lived together, I'm saying as a unit. Uh, there were other family members that lived in the mansion with them. They had a workshop where Leon would go and putter around and create uh, new musical instruments to play, strange looking things that he would make, usually with wood, mm -hmm. that uh, he would put strings to, and, and they would be fun things for the next season. Mm -hmm. And so they'd have about three or four months off. Uh, they also bought a place at uh, Lake Taney Como, and for a while they had what was called their summer mansion, whereas the Her Mansion was uh, their Springfield place. They stayed most of the wintertime, but they also had a uh, Cedar Point down at uh, Lake Taney Como that they owned for a period of time. They operated that as a business. Of course, they had cabins of their own, but they also rented out and leased out cabins. Really? This was like late 20s, early 30s. Yeah. Uh, okay, about the, the Her Mansion, uh, Killarney Cliffs. Um, so, Her built it, I don't know, about 1920, something like that. John T. Woodruff sold the Woodruff Building on January 2nd, 1929, to Her. And part of that deal was Woodruff got Killarney Cliffs. Okay. And there are photographs of Woodruff at Killarney Cliffs with his children. Uh, seemed like they lived there for a while. But the story goes that uh, Lydia Woodruff, John T.'s wife, didn't like it, thought it was too far from town, didn't it's like it. It's cold and damp. Huh? It's cold and damp. Yeah. But the, 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 the deal breaker was, allegedly, she, one day she turned on a spigot and a snake came out. Okay. <laughs> that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I haven't confirmed, did, did, the, did Woodruffs then sell it to the Weaver? As I said, I don't know. I never, that would have been about I, 1930. I yeah, I haven't checked uh, uh, the land records, of course. The Green County Archives could give you that information. You could yeah. find it with yeah. their assistance. You could get all that information specifically, but I do not know the year. Yeah. Uh, I just know certainly in the 30s they were there. So in the 30s they continued their successful act. They got their summer home or their winter quarters or what do you want to call it at Clarney Cliffs, just south of Springfield. They've got their summer mansion down on Lake Taney Como. Right. This is all pre Table Rock. Lake Taney Como right. was it pretty right. much on the White That's River right. in terms of Rockway the, Beach territory. Yeah. Um, so some point around 36, 37, 38, they decided to go to Hollywood. Uh, the story was that uh, they were doing well enough financially that the three elders of the group, the names of the group, uh, were wanting to cut back. Vaudeville was dying. By the time we get to 1936, 1937, <clears throat> Vaudeville was just almost dead as far as a major means of making a living. And so what they was, went out was with killing it? Radio? Well, yes, and just the depression and yeah. movies. Yeah. Uh, movies were a lot better than vaudeville to mm -hmm. a lot of people that preferred to see the glitzy stuff that was on the screen and uh, they had been performing at least for 15 years by the time you get to 1937 as a group, as a unit and so they were, they were well to do. I don't know how well off they honestly were. Yeah, but were they, they were good successful. shepherds of their, of their wealth or were they... You know, What's, I, were I they, think that they, uh, they made someone? some bad decisions financially but I'm not saying that that was going on in 1936, 37, yeah. because they made a very good decision when they went to make movies. Mm -hmm. So they got out of vaudeville, they wanted to return to Springfield on a more permanent basis, and had a chance, an offer they couldn't refuse from Warner Brothers, 
And so they made Swing Your Partner with Humphrey Bogart and other people in 1937, and it was actually a successful movie. Uh, movies like that were B pictures. Yeah. And they showed in the hillbilly territory, and they showed all over the Deep South. And uh, don't, you know, don't worry about, don't be laughing too much. When you see some of those movies today, they are rube hillbilly movies, but they sold well and made theater owners a lot of money. They were low budget. B That's right. So how did the B movie, you know, now we have, we have dollar theater. So a movie, a, 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 you know, major release, will go, it goes through this whole sort of pecking order. It goes here, and then it goes to, I don't know, airline, transatlantic flights, and it goes to the dollar show, and then it goes overseas. I don't know the order, but mm -hmm. you know, there's this whole sort of routine that one motion picture will go through. But were bees like, would you show them smaller, lower market theaters? Well, initially the concept of the B picture to start with was it was just something to draw people in as for preparation for the A picture, oh. or the primary picture. So like a warm up picture. But uh, the rural, uh, small town theaters, which actually were the core of the money making long term, they often just showed B pictures. They didn't even necessarily always show the two-hour movie or the two-and-a-half-hour, three-hour movie. Even right. back in those days, by the time you get to the 30s, there were some of those, you know, two-hour movies were not unusual. So they would take two or three of the B pictures and a cartoon or two and a Three Stooges or Little Rascals or something like that, and that would make for a, a, a total evening of diverse entertainment. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Weavers did very well with those pictures. Did they? They certainly did. Yeah. And uh, I have no doubt that they made... Uh, as much, if not more, money for a few years making B pictures than traveling. So it was a wise business decision. It was. And meanwhile, you're going to find that in the Springfield newspapers and the periodicals of the time, that uh, from 1938 or so on, they spent more and more time back at home okay. in Springfield or in one of their mansions. Yeah. So we're getting into the kind of mid '40s now, and had they gotten into radio before then? To my knowledge, the Weaver brothers and Elvari were not in radio at all in the '30s. Mm -hmm. uh, now KWTO and KGBX were two radio stations that existed most of the 1930s, and I am sure that there were a few times where at least Leon appeared probably on the radio on a mic somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't have any doubt about that, but I find no evidence that they did their act on radio mm -hmm. until February 1943 when they began doing a new show called Corns of Kraken. So Corns of Kraken started in February 1943. Right. Do you know whose idea it was? Well, the idea of Corns of Kraken was Ralph Foster and associates. He had a man named Arthur Johnson that was his silent partner that was with him. Ralph Foster's brother-in-law was Arthur Johnson. And Mr. Johnson was the money man. He was the bookkeeper. He took care to make sure that the KWTO and KGBX were making money. At that time, Mr. Foster, Mr. Johnson, and Lester Cox Sr. were the, own, the primary owners of KWTO and KGBX both. They'd come to Springfield in 32 and 33. So in February 1943, that was the middle of World War II. People were, that were not in service were hungry for live entertainment, mm -hmm. diverse things, something to distract them from the problems of the war. And so I, I think basically I'll just have to give Ralph Foster credit mm -hmm. for being a visionary because as far back as uh, the periodicals that the radio station was putting out in 1943, when they announced that Corns of Kraken would be premiering in Joplin, the first performance was going to be in Joplin, not in Springfield, uh, it said in 1943 that the owners of the radio station, KWTO would be the one that broadcast Corns of Kraken, although they still own KGBX. Mm -hmm. They said in the periodicals that uh, Mr. Foster and the radio executives hope someday to be able to have a network show promoting and spotlighting Ozarks Entertainment. Okay. 
And so that was a vision. That was the vision for Corns of Kraken. That's right. And the name came from Bill Bailey. Bill Bailey was uh, an announcer at KWTO, KGBX, and uh, he used that as a play on words for Hell's a Poppin', mm -hmm. which was a Broadway thing that Olson and Johnson did, mm -hmm. which was more or less contemporary vaudeville. Mm -hmm. Did Corns of Kraken have any particular meaning? Other than Bill Bailey out of his brain coming up with the phrase. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I mean, corn, corn, that's corny. Yeah, corn's a crack, and I thought maybe that's like we're going to make some moonshine. Or, I, I or, think uh, that could be, but I think that Bill Bailey in Springfield, Missouri in 1942-43, uh, when he came up with that phrase, then I think he's thinking of corn, yeah. as in not moonshine corn, but corny. Corny. Right. Probably, you know, guy kind of goofball entertainment. Comedy. Yeah. Nothing serious. There was too much serious stuff going yeah. on in World War II. They didn't need any more depression. Yeah. Uh, depressing news. So this was going to be a fast-moving hillbilly show featuring the names the Weaver Brothers and Elviry, which were the best-known names in Springfield. In so the they, were the, they were the, uh, the, the main attraction. That's of right. Corns of that was the concept. Yeah. That didn't work out that way, but that's how it started. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned Joplin. So did it start as a, just a traveling stage show? Right. I think, uh, again, mm -hmm. some people think you go back to the 1940s, you think about, uh, oh, the technology was so backward and uh, that it would have been impossible to have done remote broadcast. Radio stations did them all the time. Mm -hmm. That was not unusual at all. They had a, a, a traveling truck, a transmitter truck, and they drove that truck around, and they got their machinery all hooked up and set up, and they could broadcast by remote control just like they do today. Mm -hmm. Not the same technology, right. but the same concept same that concept. I'm on the road doing a broadcast, and I've got my mics and everything set up, mm -hmm. and the crowd's going to be able to hear what's going on on stage, and there's going to be applause, and it's going to be energetic mm -hmm. and exciting. But do we know when it actually was first broadcast? I don't have the exact date. It's February 1943. That was the first broadcast. That was that a was local the broadcast. First local broadcast. On KWTO, KWTO from Joplin. From Joplin. And as far as we know, that was the first iteration of Corn well, it was the first. It, yeah, that's the, the first, first show. show because uh, KWTO and KGBX had a monthly periodical called The Dial. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I have every reason to think that the dials that were being printed in 1942 monthly leading up to this event that occurred in February 43 are totally accurate. So there were some sort of, they were trying to build up interest in this thing. that they As a doing. regional. Yeah. They didn't have that first show in Springfield at the Shrine Mosque. That's where most of the shows would be. Mm -hmm. but they deliberately went somewhere else to establish the idea that this was not just Springfield, mm -hmm. that this was going to be a workable, with remote control equipment, and that they would be able to broadcast, and this would show uh, NBC, or CBS, or Mutual, that it could be done on a national level. Okay. So when did KWTO join the Mutual Broadcasting? Uh, I don't know the dates. I think Mutual did not exist, actually, until after World War II. I think, wasn't that NBC? It was split. Yeah, was NBC like was split, and ABC, red. and yeah. so on. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know. I just know that by 1946, Corns of Kraken was being broadcast all over the United States on the mutual broadcasting system. By 46. So within right. three years, it had gone from perhaps just an idea in Ralph Foster's brain and uh, verbal play on words from uh, Bill Bailey. Bailey to a nationally broadcast weekly radio variety. Show. Right. And uh, examples of the show exist because the Armed Forces Radio Network broadcast the shows on transcriptions, by transcription. So in my collection I have uh, excerpts. Uh, basically the show itself might go for uh, two hours, uh, if, especially if they were out of town. But the transcriptions that I've seen and I have some of that are Armed Forces then uh, those, they might only air 15 minutes, yeah. 30 at the most, yeah. usually 15 minute excerpts, and those uh, transcriptions I have, they're chopped up. But you can still get the feel. Mm -hmm. And the feel is this, <clears throat> you can't beat live. Now I know there can be mistakes, and I know there can be bloopers, mm -hmm. and I know there can be lots of things go wrong, but you can't beat the crowd. When they came, when uh, 
Corns of Kraken was broadcast, especially in the first couple of years, in Springfield. They went to the largest auditorium, which was the Shrine Mosque, which would hold 2,500, 3,000 people. And I have photos, a particular one photo. The place is literally packed, mm -hmm. totally packed. This was a big deal mm -hmm. to know that you were going to a show in 1945, 1946, that was being heard all over the United States live. Mm -hmm. Um, transcriptions, uh, today what do we call it a recording? What, what is a transcription? Transcriptions were just that. They were recordings made for radio station use yeah. that instead of, a transcription could be any size you wanted to, up to 16 inches. The largest transcriptions that were ordinarily used were 16 inch in diameter, meaning a hole in the middle, mm -hmm. 16 inches in either direction. And uh, they were just recordings uh, used for various purposes. Some entertainers wanted their shows transcribed so they could go back and listen mm -hmm. to see what they did right or what they did wrong, how they can improve their show. Other times transcriptions were used so that somebody could do a broadcast today and they were going to be out of town on the road two weeks from today and that show could be broadcast on transcription two weeks later. Okay. Advertiser, did you ever do transcriptions for advertisers? So that I, they oh could, yes, advertising say, you know, we used to. Yeah, we really did pitch your product, here it is, you know, you can listen to That's it. That's right, yeah. right. It was used for a lot of different purposes, and uh, it's a, a salvation for people that like to study history, radio history, that okay. you can go back and hear some of those shows. So, uh, what? How did, how did the Corns of Kraken and the Weaver Brothers Arkansas Travelers play out? Uh, uh, virtually nothing. No. Uh, after the very early broadcast, the three of them very seldom were on a show together. Hmm. This 1943 was basically the year that the Weaver Brothers and Elvari made had made their last movie. They made about 12 pictures for Republic. They right. made one or two for Warner Brothers, maybe another featurette under a different name. They're not, I mean, not their name being different, but another studio name. Right. And uh, Elviry and Frank were married by this time, had been married a number of years after she about, divorced Leon. They were married about, well, Leon and uh, June were married for about eight years. I don't know the year they divorced. I don't know the year, but they were divorced for four years before she married Frank. Okay. They, Frank and Elviry, who were man and wife, decided to move to California. Leon was Back left. To yes. Leon was left. We're talking within the first two years of Corns of Kraken. Leon was left here. I don't feel sorry for Leon. He was uh, not married at that time and his child or two were grown because he had had a child with another wife. So he'd been married before? He had been married an, uh, another time, besides Del Byron. Really? And he stayed here for a short time and appeared on some of the early Corns of Kraken shows, even without the other two partners. Mm -hmm. Then he also owned a theater, a movie theater of his own, over, I believe, on Commercial Street, which at that time, Commercial Street was a major place. Mm -hmm. So don't, again, that's not, don't think of... Uh, 2016, when this is being made, don't think of Commercial Street as it is now. It was a very, very prosperous area. That's right. And so uh, Leon Abner had a movie theater, and one of the keys was he was there a lot. So if you wanted to come by on Saturday night uh, when he was in town, well, he'd, he'd be there to greet you. Mm -hmm. He might even be at the box office or in the lobby, and he'd talk to you. And uh, he'd be dressed in the outfit that he wore on stage. Mm -hmm. And he did this for a while, actually owned the theater for a number of years. Then he also migrated, by the time we get to the late 1940s, he migrated also back to uh, California, where he uh, made a couple of pictures with Gene Autry, who was a, big, a major star at the time, and he died. One day, Gene Aut I interviewed Gene Autry on the radio. I never talked to him in person, mm -hmm. but uh, I asked him about the Weaver Brothers and Elvira, and he, Gene said that he had known of them when he was a kid back in Oklahoma. Gene Autry also began his career in medicine shows mm -hmm. in 1925, 1926. And so he was familiar with the Weaver Brothers and Elvira. He said they had a great act. They were among the best. This is what Gene said to me in 1987 mm -hmm. when I interviewed him. 
And uh, so he hired Leon, just to be nice to Leon, I think, mm -hmm. to honor Leon for a couple of his movies. And uh, one day they were out shooting, of course, wherever they were in the Hollywood area, and Leon did not show up. Mm -hmm. And they went to his home, his apartment, and found that he had died of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Alone, basically. Right. In uh, definitely alone. Somewhere in the L.A. area. Yes. Yeah. Close by. Close by where they were filming. Um... So where are the brothers buried? Leon was, died in California. He's buried in the Weaver Cemetery north of Ozark, Missouri. Really? And Frank and Elvary, I do not know. I suppose they're buried where they died, and I don't have that in my brain as to the exact name of the town. Hmm. But it was, you think uh, they died? I think in Washington State, wasn't it? Really? They died in Washington and State. And we're not in California. They were not in California. But Leon's body was brought back, but not Frank's. That's right. Interesting. And the other two brothers, Charlie and Max, lived here. Uh-huh. They were behind the scenes. So there's four brothers. Yeah. Two sisters. Okay. Um, so really, after after corns are crack on their careers, you will work for all intents and purposes. That's what I would say, except for Leon having almost significant roles in those last Gene Autry movies he appeared in. Yeah. I mean, he's obviously there. It's not like he's lost in the crowd. I think in one of the scenes, he's leading a square dance, maybe playing the fiddle. Mm -hmm. So he did have a, a little role there that was roles, not worthy. But they're almost. Uh, you know, yes, uh, uh, but they didn't die with vaudeville. That's important. Yeah. They they their career had a second stage, which was the movies. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've heard you speak uh, before that, as I recall, you had said that. Basically, what the KD, KWTO staff learned about Corns of Kraken helped them when in the 50s they started to develop the Ozark Jubilee. They sort of learned both the good and the bad. <laughs> For, that the Corns of Kraken was almost like a proving ground, if you will, or an um, alpha test, or uh, in hindsight. That See, the, they failure, were, the failure of Corns of Kraken... <clears throat> was when the Weaver brothers broke up their act and were not the stars of the show. They were going to be the stars of the show. Now, how that would have worked out in the long run with them being elderly people, and when I say elderly, they were only in the 50s or whatever, right. but they were not of the new generation. How that would have worked, I don't know, but I do know this. They left, and that left no star. Mm -hmm. So the Corns of Kraken show never had a star. Now, I can give you the names of all the people that were there that were important. The Slim Wilsons, the Hayden family, mm -hmm. Lou Black, Bill Rang. We can just go on from there. Wasn't Bill Rang sort of the MC? Or yes. The, yeah. Well, yes, he was. But technically, uh, then Lou Black was sometimes the MC. That's the mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. No one was in charge. Now, again, the show was good, and it was successful for a number of years. But when we get to the early 50s, add 10 years to 1943, and come up to 1953, and Ralph Foster's going to give it a go this time on TV, and radio and TV, mm -hmm. as opposed to strictly radio, then he knew, whether anybody else did or not, that one of the reasons KAK, Horns of Kraken, had failed was because they didn't have a star. So they were determined to find a star. you got to have a star, yeah. To carry... You know, in a movie you call it, you have to have some, somebody has to carry the movie. You got to have that right. male or female star that's going to draw people to the movie. That's right. Um, and the same with a radio show or a TV show. Okay. So to summarize, um, Weaver Brothers had a significant impact on today what we call the hillbilly what we think of as the archetypal hillbilly, they helped mold that image. I think so, and when it's all said and done, what other act, what other group, what other performer came out of the Ozarks that made even made 12 or 13 movies? Mm -hmm. Musicals. Now, I'm not talking about the Brad Pitts and the Kathleen Turners. Right. I'm talking about music. That's what we're kind of right. discussing right. from the musical angle, the entertainment angle, but music too. Mm -hmm. uh, no one else that I can think of has made movies that were native to the Ozarks and were musicals. Yeah. 
So, I don't have the figures, but it strikes me that a lot of uh, entertainment talent com has come out of Christian County, especially on a per capita basis. Would you agree? Well, that's true. Uh, we won't take the time at this point to go to the pictures of the troop. But, uh, for example, Lenny A. O'Shire, mm -hmm. he became, uh, he was successful in radio and TV later, but he was an original member of the Weaver Brothers at Arkansas Travelers. And he was another guy that played any all any instruments you wanted. He created and made up instruments and played them. Yeah. He was from the Ozarks. He was from Christian County. Was Goo Goo his st stage? Yeah, Goo Goo Rutledge was from Springfield. Goo Goo. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, he was his he was his partner later. Yeah. They were both with the Weaver Brothers to start with, so they weren't partners in that sense. But they became partners later in the forties. Yeah. Yeah, there's uh, quite a few. Slim Wilson we talked about being mm -hmm. from Christian County, Speedy Hallworth's roots. He was a fine guitar player. Worked a lot with Porter Wagner and many other people. Uh, Speedy's mama, who was also a musician, Aunt Martha. Aunt she Martha. was from, of course, Christian County, at least partially, and Nixa. Yep. And uh, Zed Tennis was a fine fiddler. He's the man that uh, introduced Zed Tennis, introduced uh, Chet Atkins to Cy Simon, so that Chet got his first job in Springfield working in radio here. Really? Because of Zed, who was really? from Nixa. Really? So, yes. And uh, the four others. pitch hikers were originally. Right. Um, the four pitch hikers, three of the four from Nixa. Yeah, well, the original four were all from Nixa. Right. And then one dropped out. That's right. And went to Alaska or someplace. And, um, yeah, it just strikes me that there's just a lot of, uh, you know, and I'll even we have like Abby Waterworth from Clever. Down right, Clever, we're real proud of her. She's, she's amazing, excellent. Amazing, amazing voice. So, right. There's something about Christian County. <laughs> well, it's the Scotch Irish. Yeah. Immigration thing, going back to the migration patterns, going yeah. back to the Carolinas, Tennessee, and Kentucky. Yeah. Uh, now, do I have this correct? That uh, so briefly about Elviry, um, she was a model as well, uh, not a, not a fashion model, but she was a model for other stage presences. So I'd read that um, if I have this correctly, Lula Bell, which I think Red Foley and Lula Bell had yeah. had a shtick. They did. They worked together. He was called Burhead. Burhead. Lula Bell and Burhead. Read fully in his early years. This is uh, WGN Barn Dance. WLS. WLS, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the Lula Bell's character, stage presence, was modeled in a, some regard. John Lair had said, you want to understand how to project on stage, go look at Elvira. Right. Go watch Elvira. I hadn't heard that, but that certainly is obvious if you see her dress, her style, yeah. in the early years especially. Who knows about Minnie Pearl? Yeah, there you go. There's another one too. So, yeah. So that kind of country Judy girl, Canova. country girl who's uh, candid, forthright, sometimes boy crazy, uh, funny. It's true. Okay. Well, thanks very much for talking to us about. Well, the you Weaver, are welcome. Weaver Brothers Nail Viry. Glad to do it. All right. Thanks.